And so this personhood theory posits that if you're not self-aware over time, or if you do not have the capacity to value your own life, you are not a person. And that means you have less value. So instead of having human beings have ultimate moral value, or unique moral value, or the highest moral value, however you want to phrase it, it is in this view persons that do. And in this view, there are human non-persons. All embryos are non-persons, they're not self-aware over time. Fetuses also. Fetuses may have a brain, but they're not conscious as far as we know. They're certainly not able to enjoy their life or value their life. Newborn infants are deemed non-persons in this view. Some bioethicists understand that the ramification for babies, born babies, would be very dire if they were deemed non-persons, and so they will call them potential persons. Because, well, they have the potential to become persons. Well, so do embryos and fetuses. But even that doesn't help people at the other end, people who have lost these capacities. People like Terry Schiavo, who was diagnosed with a persistent vegetative state or may have been had a minimally conscious state, is deemed a non-person. People like my late uncle Bruno Micheletti, who died of Alzheimer's disease, at the end would have been deemed a non-person. And this has terrible ramifications for human equality, and it has terrible ramifications for the potential to oppress these so-called human non-persons. I want to read just a little bit from some bioethics literature, so you'll see what I'm talking about, because it becomes very clear the danger to the most weak and vulnerable among us. Not only embryos and fetuses, but babies, and uh, people who have severe uh, auto accidents and have head injuries and the elderly and so forth. And these are not people who are off in a corner on the internet with a pyramid on their head made of tin foil. That would be me. <laughs> but these are people writing in the most prestigious journals of medicine and bioethics and philosophy in the world. These are the people who are relied upon by government uh, committees, as Nate was talking about, to provide the recommendations for public policy. These are people who are brought into court to be expert witnesses on what is right and what is wrong. These are people who, as I said previously, are teaching those who will be in charge of government tomorrow, in charge of business tomorrow, and doctors of tomorrow, nurses of tomorrow, and so forth. And this is an article called The Concept of the Person and the Value of Life. It was published in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal. That is an extremely prestigious bioethical journal on the Georgetown University campus. The Kennedy Institute of Ethics was established by Rose and Joseph Kennedy, and it was meant to, be, to uh, analyze these various ethical issues. And this journal is incredibly influential. It's certainly in the top 10 in the world, perhaps the top five. And the author is John Harris, who's a, a, he's over in England. Uh, he's the Sir David Alliance Professor of Bioethics and Research Director, Center for Social Ethics and Policy, Director of the Institute of Medicine, Law, and Bioethics, University of Manchester, England. And he's very influential in setting the National Health Service's uh, bioethical priorities over in the UK. And here's what he wrote. And listen very carefully to this, because when I first read this, I had black hair. <laughs> Many, if not most, of the problems of healthcare ethics presuppose that we have a view about what sorts of beings have something that we might think of as ultimate moral value. Or if that sounds too apocalyptic, then we certainly need to identify those sorts of individuals who have the highest moral value or importance. Think about that. If he had said, we have to identify the race that has the highest moral value or importance. We would say, sir, that is a bigoted statement and we would be right. But this is the same discriminatory attitude, just different victims. He goes on to say what this means. Quote, personhood provides a species neutral, remember what I said about speciesism, a species neutral way of grouping creatures that have lives that it would be wrong to end by killing or by letting die. These may include animals, machines, extraterrestrials, gods, angels, and devils. Big brain. 
Persons who want to live are wrong by being killed because they are thereby deprived of something they value. See the relativism also that sneaks in here. It isn't wrong to kill people because it's wrong to kill them. It's only wrong if they value their own lives. So he goes on to say non-persons or potential persons, what are potential persons? Babies. Cannot be wronged in this way because death does not deprive them of anything they can value. If they cannot wish to live, they cannot have that wish frustrated by being killed. Personhood theory tells us who we can kill and get a good night's sleep. It gets even worse. Tom Beecham, B-E-A-U-C-H-A-M-P, it might be pronounced Beauchamp, is one of the most notable bioethicists in the world. He co-authored a book called The Principles of Biomedical Ethics, which is used throughout the world in bioethics courses in universities. And writing again in the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, he said, because many humans lack properties of personhood or are less than full persons, they are thereby rendered equal or inferior in moral standing to some non-humans. If this conclusion is defensible, we will need to rethink our traditional view that these unlucky humans cannot be treated in the way to be relevantly, treat relevantly similar non-humans. For example, they might be aggressively used as human subjects and sources of organs, human research subjects and sources of organs. Very, very scary stuff. May mentioned Peter Singer. Where does this lead? For example, it leads to a desire to allow infanticide. Peter Singer's claim to fame, and they're relevantly connected. Number one, with a book called Animal Liberation, he started the radical animal rights movement. Number two, he is the world's foremost proponent of infanticide. Some call it post-birth abortion. And he wrote this about a child with hemophilia. When the death of a disabled infant will lead to the birth of another infant with better prospects of a happy life, the total amount of happiness will be greater if the disabled infant is killed. The loss of a happy life for the first infant is outweighed by the gain of a happier life for the second. Therefore, if killing the hemophiliac infant has no adverse effect on others, it would, according to the total view, be right to kill him. Now, realize what Peter Singer is saying, and I will try not to lose my temper. What Peter Singer is saying is that if a baby is born with a disability and that baby does not suit the needs of the family, indeed, if that baby might interfere with a hypothetical future sibling who is not even born yet and the parents do not wish to keep that baby, that baby should be allowed to be killed. And it isn't based on the baby being born with a disability. It is based on the baby being a non-person, supposedly which means not only could babies with disabilities be killed under this theory, but babies who are born uh, uh, what might be called normal and healthy. Which I guess means that when that desperate uh, young girl gives birth in a bathroom and throws the baby in the toilet, she's done nothing really wrong. This is very serious stuff, and it, as you can see, I'm sure the relevance to the embryonic stem cell issue, because the pretext for this uh, research and for pursuing this is that these embryos are non-persons. Sometimes they're even called non-human. What are they, Martians? Chopped liver? I've had bioethicists in debates say, oh, they're just a ball of cells. And I say, well, for that matter, so are you, sir. If you get to that level, we're all just a bunch of cells together. This isn't just Hypothetically, either in the Netherlands, which isn't far from here, under the euthanasia program, Dutch doctors now kill babies born with terminal conditions and serious disabilities. It's called the Groningen Protocol. G-R-O-N-I-N-G-E-N. According to the Lancet, there are about 80 to 90 babies each year killed in the Netherlands by doctors through lethal injections. 8% of all babies who die each year in the Netherlands are killed by doctors. 8% who die. Not 8% of all infants, but 8% of all infants who die in the Netherlands are killed by doctors. So you can see where these ideas lead to practical application. Everything that we ever do as a species starts with an idea. And this idea of the human non-person is already leading to practical application, as in the infanticide case.
If that's true, then why wouldn't we, as David Prentice discussed, move past embryonic stem cell research, move past destroying a one-week-old embryo, and move to outright fetal farming, particularly since there might be better tissues that could be obtained, and you, there might be, even if you use cloning, there might be organs that could be obtained. Why wouldn't you? If a fetus isn't a person, if we're already advocating using people in PBS in this manner, why wouldn't we use a fetus, particularly if you create an artificial womb, which may be online within 10 years? And the same arguments that Uncle Charlie's Parkinson's disease can be cured, or that the child will never be born because this artificial womb won't permit the uh, gestation to go past five months will be heard. And for people out there who are afraid of dying or seeing loved ones suffer, and if they fall into that utilitarian mindset, that becomes very attractive. Because the biggest argument that they've had in favor, for example, of the embryonic stem cell research, is that we're only going to use embryos that are going to be tossed out anyway. That's a very utilitarian and seductive argument. And it won't stop there. It will not especially since, as David showed you with the fetal farming experiments that have already taken place in animals, they're projecting ahead, especially since very influential people have talked about reproductive cloning, and the transhumanists are talking about creating a posthuman species. To show you how far out this gets, and I'll close with this, let me tell you some things that may seem unrelated, but I contend are completely connected because they say no to the question I pose. Spain has just legalized the Great Ape Project, which creates a community of moral equals between human beings, chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos, and orangutans. The Great Ape Project was started by Peter Singer in 1993, and look how fast it's gone. The purpose of the Great Ape Project is to have a United Nations declaration creating a moral equality between human beings and apes, which is intended to break the species barrier, according to Peter Singer in the book, The Great Ape Project, and create this concept of the quality of life ethic that I described. It's already happening, and that is directly related to saying that being human does not have intrinsic or unique moral value. Switzerland has de declared the intrinsic dignity of plants. The intrinsic dignity of plants. And the example of a, an immoral action by the Swiss Ethics Committee that decided what that meant was, if a farmer, and this is the word they used, decapitates a flower, a wildflower, they've done a very moral wrong. We laugh and we roll our eyes as we should, and ridicule is a good weapon. But can you see where the danger is? There was a Swiss scientist who was complaining that he tried to get a license to do genetic studies to create wheat that would resist fungus. And there was a resistance because of this dignity of plant issues. So he finally said it would be good for the wheat. And he was able to get the license. The Court of Human Rights is declaring it has just taken a case to have a chimp declared a person. And Ecuador, in its constitution, has just given equal rights to nature with human beings. The point of this is to have our, you know, and the deep ecologists are saying we're the vermin species on the planet Gaia. Uh, Paul Watson, who's the head of the uh, Sea Shepherd Nature Society, has called human beings the AIDS of the planet Earth. The point of this is to make us so degraded in our self-conception that we will sacrifice ourselves and our flourishing for the planet. And of course, the people who will be doing that are the poor and the destitute, because the powerful never have to abide by the same rules. These are the stakes. The embryonic stem cell cloning debate, and I think they should be considered together, because it's not just embryonic stem cell are part of a larger struggle about the sanctity and equality of human life and a determination whether we will consider ourselves to be a unique and special species in which human rights come just simply from being human. Those are the stakes. I hope Ireland will help lead us toward a more moral future. Thank you very much.